Today, we're going to continue getting a PhD on YouTube in uh, indoor chemistry. Uh, this is the 31 part series that's all about the chemistry of indoor environments uh, experiment. That was a 10 year long experiment. Right now, we're going to continue talking about ventilation. And last week, when we talked about home ventilation and some of the side effects for chemistry that happened there, you'll start to think about that. And then you get your mind blown when you think about sending your kids to the other place that they spend a huge amount of time, which is their school. And I don't know about you, but I worry a lot about that kind of thing. Cause like, I can't control that. And in fact, the school that my kids go to, they don't even want, they're like continuing the COVID protocol of like, we're not really going to get the parents involved. So that's where we're at. This is where my mind is at. I hope that you find this research into school ventilation interesting. This is from Sweden. We're going to talk to Sarka Langer, who is a researcher there in Sweden. I spoke with her, as I always do, and I've got my list of things that I'm going to be clarifying um, for you as commentary on this. So let's go ahead and get into it. So today I would like to tell you about uh, our project and its results that uh, have studied the impact of ventilation systems on indoor air quality in Swedish primary school classrooms. The primary objective of our project was to study just uh, the ventilation strategies. So we decided uh, to look at uh, three categories of ventilation system. One was natural ventilation, exhaust ventilation, or automated window opening, which is also known under the name of window master. And then we had uh, balanced ventilation, mechanical ventilation with heat recovery, with constant airflow volume, and uh, balanced mechanical ventilation with variable airflow volumes, VAV. And we named the categories as ABC, and it is how it will be, uh, how, how you will see the results on the next slides. The investigation was performed in 23 building, school buildings when we selected uh, one or two or three uh, classrooms in each building. And uh, uh, we selected the classrooms in the uh, grade four, which uh, in Sweden are children of the age between 10 and 12 years. And we performed the measurements during one school week from Monday morning uh, to Friday afternoon. So for the indoor air quality, uh, we measured uh, selected parameters, uh, ventilation rate, temperature, relative humidity, and uh, concentration of carbon dioxide. And from the air pollutants, we selected ozone, nitrogen dioxide, formaldehyde, and VOCs. We also measured uh, particles, PM10 and PM2.5, but uh, it is not the uh, subject of the presentation today. We have also developed an acute questionnaire for the children. It is uh, quite unusual. Normally, the questionnaire service are directed to adults. And uh, the questionnaire contains uh, questions about thermal environment, indoor air quality, noise and light, and uh, also questions on sensation of comfort alertness and other impressions. So this is the questionnaire. Uh, we had got responses for <clears throat> more than 900 children from the 45 classrooms. And uh, <clears throat> they answered questions about thermal sensation and preference right now. And then preference in general, like how do you feel generally in the classroom? of temperature, odor, noise, and light. And sensations, I don't know, how do you feel in general in the classroom about alertness, focus, willingness to work, and headache. Uh, so now to the results. We have already uh, summarized and published the major results from this work. Uh, results on the measurement is uh, published uh, in the first article with Blanka Tsabowska as the first author. And results from the questionnaire studies, uh, it was compiled and mainly written of our colleagues from DTU with the first author, Natalia Vasquez. And it uh, came out just uh, earlier this year. 
So here I would like to tell you about selected results of the effect of ventilation systems on indoor air quality, indoor air chemistry, and the children's perception. First on air change rates and carbon dioxide concentration, about TVOC and selected volatile organic compounds, ozone itself, and uh, about the perception index that was a result from the questionnaire study. It can be obvious that uh, the different uh, ventilation strategies will provide, will, will be base uh, for differences in indoor air quality and chemistry. But it is, it is nice to see the differences uh, as the uh, numbers. Uh, <clears throat> the first, uh, the first uh, box uh, to the left, it shows the CO2 concentration in the classroom of the different ventilation classes. And you can see that uh, there was a statistically significant differences between the naturally ventilated classrooms and the mechanically ventilated classrooms. But the difference between the constant air volumes and variable air volumes was not uh, significant. Uh, then uh, approximately the same relationship or, or the same we, we see for air change rate. Air change rate was calculated from decay of CO2 concentration. And again, much lower air change rates in the A category compared to B and C categories. We have also looked at the ratio of the actual ventilation rate uh, in comparison to what is required uh, by the Swedish uh, authorities. And then again, significant differences between the A category with the other two ones. Uh, then median carbon dioxide concentration was below medians that were observed in similar studies in European and United States schools. And then median air change rate was on the other side much higher than what was observed in similar European studies. Okay, let's uh, I'd like to clarify a couple things. <clears throat> One is that on the left, I don't know if you guys do this. I, I'm not like a trained statistician or scientist. My eyes naturally go to the colors first and I'm like, ooh, pretty colors. And then I have to be like, okay, what is this doing? So anyway, I, I just, that's like a funny thing that happens to me. On the left, you see the big red uh, wide bar and that represents the amount of variability in the CO2 during the occupied time in the classroom. And that is the story of why we don't just open windows in general. There are more examples of why we don't do this. Basically, we're going to get to a bunch of reasons why you just don't, you can't open windows and depend on that. Um, it turns out that it's like just not a very good way of doing this. That being said, here you can see in this one example that we've got a huge variability between 600 parts per million and up to 1600 parts per million from the classrooms. And I believe that she said that there were eight, eight classrooms had this natural ventilation going on in A. Three of them had the window master, which is an automated window opening uh, system. And five of them were manual opening. So you open the window when you felt like it. The teacher would do that. We have then what you see in the second and the third graphs over here, where the ventilation air change rate was low, but again, with a huge amount of variability, like basically between 0.3 and three and a half. That's like a, an order of magnitude, 10 times difference between different uh, classrooms within this group of eight. And then the difference here between the medians, and the median is this line right here um, of these, is, is not that interesting. So like the difference between the constant airflow, which is how I have my ERV set up, I tend to advocate for constant airflow versus the variable airflow, which is this one right here, which would be more like demand-based. The system turns itself up based on factors that it decides are meaningful, like CO2 or like particulate or like whatever it is that you decide. And I don't have any data and she didn't either, I don't think on how these ventilation systems were configured because she's not a ventilation person, she's a research chemist. So the uh, ratio of actual to required ventilation rate, both of these gave you what the uh, Swedish authority, the Swedish Work Environment Authority 
sets as like the the reasonable um, level of ventilation. None of the natural ventilation did that basically. So again, this is it's just saying at this point that mechanical ventilation beats natural ventilation when you're actually looking at the data. And you see the ratio of the actually required ventilation rate. It was uh, <clears throat> below the requirements and in a quite large extension. Uh, all of the category A, the naturally ventilated classrooms, but even those mechanically ventilated. And uh, next, uh, we looked at the concentrations of volatile organic compounds expressed as uh, total VOCs. There were no differences in medians among the ventilation categories of the classrooms. And uh, there was uh, no really exciting chemicals was the usual suspects, terpenes, cyclic saloxines, glycol ethers, and uh, uh, straight chain aldehydes uh, from hexanal to decanal. Uh, but on the individual VOC level, we saw differences. Firstly, for formaldehyde, that was uh, also higher in the in the a category classrooms compared to the other ones. And also for, for isoprene, there was the differences between the naturally ventilated classrooms and the mechanically ventilated classrooms even more statistically significant. Okay, now <clears throat> on the left, what that graph says over here is that measuring TVOCs is not a good idea. It's just not that meaningful. So that's what she was trying to show with this graph over here. This graph right here for formaldehyde, once they're kind of saying, okay, total VOCs is everything you can smell, all lumped into one big pile. Uh, again, not meaningful. When you just take formaldehyde, which is one of the VOCs that is part of that big pile, you can see that actually it doesn't look like natural ventilation is that much worse than B or C, either of the mechanically ventilated ones. Um, and that is not because natural ventilation is good. That is because of background information and context, which I asked, like, why does the formaldehyde look so good? She said, because buildings that use natural ventilation, even though everybody knows mechanical ventilation is better than natural ventilation, why would you not have mechanical ventilation? Because you're in an old building. So the formaldehyde, in the in case of these natural ventilated A category right here, these have all off-gassed a ton of their formaldehyde that they would have off-gassed. These, B and C, were newer buildings, and they were still in the midst of off-gassing the formaldehyde that was built into the buildings with the building products. So those were unnaturally higher. The A was unnaturally lower. They should have looked a lot more like the isoprene over here. And isoprene, we've looked at this as part of this series before. Isoprene is a uh, compound that's given off by living beings. So plants and animals, basically. So if you have isoprene, you know that there's something that's alive, um, that's off getting You could think of it as kind of a BO. And we're going to get more into BO in a minute. Well, uh, the concentration of formaldehydes in these Swedish classrooms uh, was <laughs> similar to medians reported in other European schools. And the uh, isoprene, well, the differences were strong. And also, uh, the number of children in the classrooms were quite similar. So it uh, cannot be uh, regarded to the number of, of occupants. With regards to ozone, there was only a difference between A and C category classrooms, uh, but there was a very strong statistical significant differences uh, in the ozone indoor to outdoor ratios. And we also calculated uh, a new metric, which is uh, called ozone loss. It is a difference between indoor and outdoor concentration. And then we also find uh, that significant difference between the AA and A and C classes. Uh, <clears throat> to, to compare the ozone concentration in this Swedish classroom, Ozone in the schools, kindergartens, child care center, et cetera, around the world. 
concentration uh, found were between 1.2 and 62 micrograms per cubic meter. So you can see, compare with, with the concentrations found in the left picture, was quite similar to our results. And also the indoor to outdoor ratios were, in our results were similar to what was generally found. Uh, we also made a comparison of, of the outdoor levels because the schools were uh, simulated in different uh, parts of, of the city of Gothenburg, and we didn't find any statistically significant differences. Uh, then the ozone loss uh, at the right hand uh, panel said so so differences between outdoor and indoor, or not indoor and outdoor, yeah has been suggested as a metric for concentration of products of indoor air chemistry in a recent article of uh, Charlie Weschler and Bill Nassaro. Okay, so on the left, you can see that the amount of ozone in these uh, schoolrooms might not make sense based on what we've seen already, like the amount of ventilation that B and C are getting is way more than the amount of A. So why is A so big on the, the ozone here? Especially when you then look over here at the ozone loss, A is losing a ton, even though it's really low over here. So what that is, is basically when you naturally ventilate, you've got the windows wide open, there's no filter. When we uh, heard Michael Link's presentation from last week, he was talking about the more you ventilate, the more ozone you're going to bring in. The, the other side of that is if you ventilate with just no ductwork or machine or anything like that, the ozone is sticky. So it sticks to things on the way in. But when you open the windows, there's nothing for it to stick to. It just comes right inside. So yes, you're getting a kind of a flood of ozone. But in A's case with the natural ventilation, it's hanging out in the room for a really long time because that air change rate is really low. By the way, that air change rate, I believe, is based on a, a tracer gas test, which we've talked about before on the channel. And so the ozone is getting time to react with other chemicals in the room. And one of the main things, I don't know if in Sweden, kids are crazy about Axe body spray, for example, but that stuff has got a ton of chemicals in it that are just like, it's got, it says six chemicals on the back, the ingredients list, it's got a hundred in it basically. And they're just constantly reacting with everything. So ozone comes in, reacts with a bunch of stuff and also then decomposes itself over time, I guess, as well. That's from Sarka, not from me. Um, so basically, uh, the ozone becomes kind of like the TVOC conversation. It's like maybe not the best metric for measuring this because there's a lot going on, essentially. One other thing I want to point out is this right here and this right here. I asked about this because those are outliers that are extreme. Like the reason that this is down here, but then this goes whoop, all the way out there is because of that right there. And so that I asked her, she said, I need to go back and look at my notes because that is weird. She said that that was basically a teacher uh, opening the window on a polluted day. This was one of the classrooms that had the ERV running in con constant airflow mode, and they just opened the window to supplement it on a day when like something was happening. So anyway, that's what that is. That's outlier. Then um, what uh, different ventilation system mean to indoor air chemistry? This is this can be demonstrated on uh, on the cases of uh, six MHO, six methyl heptan two on. It is the primary reaction product from reaction between ozone and squalene in in human skin. Uh, so interestingly, the, the difference this were statistically significant in the same manner as most of the other uh, parameters. Uh, higher, of course, in the uh, naturally ventilated classrooms of category A. Then we <clears throat> try to find some uh, comparison with other indoor MHO concentrations. But from <clears throat> a chamber study that was a part of a, a iCheer project, uh, there was uh, something between a half and uh, one and a half microgram per cubic centimeter, but it only included the four participants. And that was the article uh, with the first author, Nijing Wang. 
and there was even stronger differences between the canal. The canal is the most abundant aldehydic product from ozonolysis of uh, from ozonolysis of components in skin oils. Then uh, you can see that the relationship between uh, 6-MHO and ozone is not like straightforward or something. So we have data if anybody of the modelers would be interested. What she just said is that the graph on the right, the little dots, doesn't make sense. Um, and so she's offering her data to the modelers and saying, like, hey, why don't you guys mess around with this and figure out what in the world is going on? Because we don't get it. Um, the ozone being really high and the 6-MHO being low, like that makes sense where it would have an inverse relationship because as she explained, 6-methyl-5-heptan-2-1, which I love. I want to memorize that. I won't, but I want to. I think it's cool. Uh, that is a product of ozone coming in and reacting with squalene, which is a component in your skin oil. So the skin oil thing is important because it's based on this 21 person classroom. So supposedly all these classrooms are the same size. The thing that is different here that you can see some, like the variability here, if, you if you're not used to seeing graphs like this, there's like extremes, which are these dots out here. And then I think the bulk, like the bell curve is defined by these bars here. I should have done my homework on how to read these better. Uh, anyway, you can see that it's it's variable. The, there are eight classrooms in this right here. And that's like a huge difference, five times different. And that is because some kids are stinkier than other kids. Decanol is, as I understand it, a kind of body odor. A nonanol, which is nine, it's like the, the it's got nine carbons on it. That is uh, frequently associated with old people smell. So it's like the old people BO that has a specific kind of flavor. That's non and all. Decanol is, I think, another version of that that would just basically kind of be associated with younger people. As uh, for the children's uh, perception, uh, there was a, a so called perception index constructed uh, of the results from the uh, questions 12 and 13. And uh, what was uh, really surprising to us that the differences in the between the categories was not significant. So it means that the children really don't, don't care how the classroom is ventilated. They have other problems. Can you guys hear the researchers laughing in the background? Um, <laughs> that's how I feel. I feel like this a lot of the time when you guys are like, why is this channel so underrated? Um, it's because this, like people don't tend to notice these things. Once you start noticing things, then it becomes like an unavoidable thorn in your mind, but the kids don't care and that's okay. And frankly, like, again, I'm going to remind everybody, we're not out to save the whole world. You don't have to make everybody's home healthier than it already is. A lot of people don't mind. We're a very adaptive species and also everyone dies. Um, that's so like coming down from that philosophical 30,000 foot view, uh, when you are using these ventilation strategies, using people's feedback for whether it's working or not is not a good idea. That's why testing, 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 testing. So important because, and also the other thing that'll happen is uh, you're going to get some complaints. You can see here that A is low. So let's just say that you were to say, okay, we've listened to you. We've heard you homeowners or students or, uh, you know, university professors or whoever it is that we're talking to, you didn't, you don't really like, you know, we're like below five on this for the A side for opening windows. It's not what's going to make you happy. We're going to spend a bunch of money and we're going to get you B instead, a constant airflow volume through an ERV that's going to make everything better. And what will happen is that people will then readjust their bias within their head and they'll reset their expectations. Their expectations were here and now you've just made it like this, but they're still going to have the full range of human experience within that, whatever that range is. So they're going to have good days and bad days. And you might end up, you can see that there's a B that's reporting that's lower than the lowest A reporting classroom. That should trouble you. And so again, we want to protect ourselves as people who are doing this work for other people, if you're a contractor, by not depending on your client's perceptions, put in monitoring devices. And then you can say to them, hey, I know you feel like actually it's worse now than it was before, but it's not, it's just your perception bias. 
it's not reality because we actually have the numbers that shows that the house is actually doing better now or the classroom or whatever it is we're talking about. Uh, <clears throat> uh, from Spearman, uh, correlation test we found that the perception index was only correlated with uh, change rates. To conclude, ventilation systems in the classrooms have impact on air change rate, of course, on indoor air quality, carbon dioxide, VOCs, ozone, and uh, indoor to outdoor ratios and ozone loss. And then we can also observe reaction products from indoor air chemistry, and their concentration are also dependent on the ventilation rate. Differences were not significant between ventilation system. <clears throat> Differences were significant for the system using untreated outdoor air uh, category A and treated outdoor air B and C. And the differences were not significant for the systems with constant or variable air volumes. And the children's perception did not differ with the ventilation system. So just to clarify, if you're going to get an ERV, whether you use demand control or continuous airflow, you probably won't tell the difference. And in fact, the data wouldn't tell the difference either. Any ventilation that's a serious ventilation solution is better than nothing. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and the, the Swedish Research Council for Sustainable Development for funding of this project. Thank you. Thank you.